I'd like to welcome you to this one hour presentation where we're going to be talking all about the identification and troubleshooting of airway graphics and loops. This is an area that I am very passionate about. Uh, it's not an area that I was always real good at. And it a lot of times seems to be an area that goes misunderstood, especially uh, for, for new grads and, and recent people out in, in the workforce. Uh, it's just something that, that we don't spend a whole lot of time looking at, although we most certainly should be. Better understanding of what you're looking at will allow you to provide better mechanical ventilation for your patients by creating better synchrony, hopefully leading to the use of less sed sedation, and ultimately fewer vent days fewer ICU days and better patient outcomes. So let's jump in and see what we're going to be talking about. Um, we've got a couple of objectives here. We're going to recognize and identify the normal scalar graphics. We're going to identify what normal looks like for the loops as well. So when we talk about waveform and loops and finding what's wrong with it, we first have to have a base knowledge of what normal looks like. Once we understand normal, we can identify abnormal. Uh, we're going to define some of the common scalar graphics and loops abnormalities, specifically how to identify a leak when assessing the volume waveform, identifying flow hunger when assessing the pressure waveform, air trapping in conjunction with the flow waveform, airway obstructions when assessing a flow volume loop, and identify appropriate peep settings and other abnormalities when assessing the pressure volume loop. So we're going to go take you through all five of the different waveforms and loops. There's three waveforms and two loops. And at the end of this, you'll be able to recognize at least one abnormality in each of those five areas. Now, I said, we need, remember, we have to start by recognizing what normal looks like. Well, this is going to be normal waveforms in volume control. Now, when we talk about volume control, we know that we're going to have a pressure, a flow, and a volume waveform. So the top one here is pressure. We know that pressure usually has some level of peep, and then we come up and then fall back down. This is what a normal pressure waveform looks like in volume control. Now, if you do an inspiratory hold, we know we get something like this. And that right there represents our plateau pressure. So this is normal pressure waveform in your volume control. Now, the flow can be one of two things. It can be either a square flow pattern or sometimes commonly can also be a decelerating flow pattern. Yes, there are partially decelerating flow patterns and yes, there are ascending flow patterns. The square and the decelerating are the two most common that you typically see. Then with the volume waveform, what we know is volume comes up and then volume comes back down to baseline. Next breath, volume comes up, volume returns to baseline. And what we see here is where our volumes are constant. Let's say we have a tidal volume set at 450 milliliters. What we see here where the volume comes up, hits that 450, and then we cycle into expiration because we're controlling that volume. Now we're controlling volume and we're controlling flow when we're in volume control. So don't be shocked if you have a breath that does this in pressure control because we're not controlling pressure. So dynamic or, or, or resistance goes down or compliance uh, changes or, or resistance changes you can get a change in your pressure waveform. That's where the change is going to be seen. Okay, so those are normal for volume control. Now, when we look at pressure control, we know that we're going to have peep like this. We're going to come up and have a square waveform back down and then back to peep. Next breath comes up square back down. This is pressure control pressure waveform. Your pressure waveform will always be square because that's what pressure control does. It increases to a set pressure and it holds it. So let's just say this is 25 centimeters of water pressure. It rises to that pressure and then holds it for the set I time. Now, what we know with pressure control is that we're going to have a square pressure waveform. When we look at our flow waveform, we're going to get a decelerating pattern every single time. So pressure control is always a square pressure waveform and always a decelerating flow pattern waveform. So you see it come up here and you see it back down and then back to baseline. Always decelerating in pressure control. Now your, your volume is going to come up here and up to whatever volume is delivered and it exhales at the end of the I time. This is how it works, volume. Now you notice the volumes here are different. We have one up here and one here. 
Well, that is because in pressure control, changes in compliance and or resistance will affect your volumes. It will cause them to go down or if things get better, it may cause them to go up. But we know that now our volumes will be the ones that are now varying. All right. So that's normal. So now let's talk about some abnormalities. Now, this really isn't really an abnormality that has to do with synchronies or, or the lack of synchrony. This is more or less just when I look at my pressure waveform in volume control, there's some key things here that can help you recognize things earlier in the patient assessment process or the patient assessment phase. Remember, I told you this is normal. Right now, what happens if we have an airway resistance problem? It's going to give us a waveform that is going to look different than if we have a compliance problem. So airway resistance versus static compliance. That's what we're talking about. Well, here are your two options. You may have one that looks like this. And another that looks like this. So two different options here. Okay, but you can tell they look very, very different. Well, the key here is notice that in this second option here, this, this second pressure waveform, notice how our plateau pressure from normal has essentially stayed the same. But we see a big rise in pressure control in our PIP. This is our PIP up here. Well, if you remember airway resistance formula, airway resistance equals PIP minus plateau divided by flow in liters per second. But the first part of that formula is PIP minus plateau. In other words, the larger this number, the greater your airway resistance is. And so here, this is definitely an increase in airway resistance. And we would be thinking something along the lines here, maybe with asthma and a bronchospasm, maybe excessive secretions, something causing an airway obstruction that is leading to a large amount of airway resistance. Now over here in this last pressure waveform we have drawn, you notice here where our plateau pressure has gone way up and our PIP has also gone up. But the difference between them is still very small. See, so, so because the difference is small, this is not an airway resistance problem. This is a decrease in your static compliance. It has gone down. So you would see something like this with ARDS, pneumonia, a pneumothorax, a large pleural effusion, anything that causes a reduction in your alveolar compliance. You will see your plateau pressures rise, your PIP rises along with it, but the difference between them stays very, very small. So that's quickly just doing your inspiratory hold before you go look at any other numbers you can assess and see, am I staying in this state of normalcy? Or are, we, are we on an even path here? Or has an acute change happened that is leading to a large airway resistance problem or perhaps a, a reduction in my alveolar compliance by my, by my rising plateau pressure? So that's how we tell the difference between static compliance and airway resistance problems just by looking at the pressure waveform. Again, this is in volume control. We know that because our waveforms were not square. Now, if you're square, if you're in pressure control and you have these square waveforms, you're not going to get these changes because that's what pressure control does. Pressure control controls the pressure. So you won't see those drops down the plateau pressures that allow you to differentiate between airway resistance or compliance. You just know your volumes are down. You got to figure out why are your volumes down when you're in pressure control? It could be either of those. Okay, uh, this next one here is fairly common. It's called failure to trigger. Uh, this one is, I say fairly common because it's one that we, we readily identify uh, and usually are pretty good at being able to pick up. But we're finding that uh, with some of these, these um, vent modes, uh, we get a large amount of maybe auto peep or something and we start to lose the sight of these these uh, attempts for the patient to trigger a breath and, and and we're not always picking up on them. So let's show you what we're looking for here. We know that we have a, a breath coming up like this and coming back down. Patient dips in and you should see a breath in, right? 
You see that breath because the patient triggered it because there's that pressure dip right there. Anytime the diaphragm drops, it's going to reduce the pressure in the closed ventilator circuit. Now, if you're coming along here and you get a dip, but no response, well, you have to ask yourself, did this patient attempt to take a breath, but the ventilator failed to recognize it as an attempt? See, if we have a lot of auto peak present and we're actually truly running up here and the vent is going, well, if you pull down to here, I'll give you a breath. The vent is unable to accommodate for all of this extra peak. Well, we may not get down there far enough and we may have a failure to trigger. The vent will not recognize the patient attempts. This sounds like something we should probably address and fix. Cruelty is putting a patient on a ventilator and then not letting them breathe the way they want to. Now, with our flow, we can see the same thing. We know our flow pattern may look something like this. Maybe decelerating. It's not going to be both. And then what we see is when we come over here, and we return back up, we see this little dip like that. Now the flow goes upwards because the patient, as the diaphragm drops, pulls flow back towards it, towards the, the patient. And so you see an increase in your inspiratory on your expiratory side, but you see an upward bump. This is the patient saying, hey, I want a breath and they didn't get one. So here again, you might see on the flow waveform, also, patient efforts that are not detected by the ventilator. Is our sensitivity set appropriately? Is there the presence of auto peep? Or are we running a, a small volume nebulizer off of a flow, uh, flow meter, adding additional flow to the circuit, and we're masking the, uh, the amount of flow that's actually in the circuitry so the vent doesn't recognize a drop in flow and flow triggering? So a lot of different things it could be. Just have to ask yourself, first, recognize it. Two, what can I do to fix it? And go from there. Okay, uh, we talk about a leak. Uh, we're gonna look at our flow pattern and our volume pattern here, or our waveforms. Uh, we know that our flow pattern is gonna come up, the breath is delivered, something like this. With our volume though, with a leak, we see something that comes up like this, and then when it comes down, it fails to return to baseline. So what you see here is right here, this is the problem. This much of the volume did not return to the ventilator, which means there is a leak somewhere in the circuit. Now, the fact that the, that the flow waveform does return to baseline is very, very important because we're going to see here in just a few minutes how this volume may not return in the presence of air trapping also, and that should make sense. If all of the air doesn't come out because the patient is air trapping, then this will not return to baseline. In this situation, we didn't return to baseline even though our flow did return to baseline. In other words, there's no more flow coming out. So this is all that's gonna come out. And we didn't get it all the way back to baseline. So this is a leak. This will commonly be at the end of tracheal cuff, um, or yeah, at the end of tracheal tube cuff, uh, it may be seen with a large uh, pneumothorax where you have a large leak coming out into your chest tube. You may not get all your volume back because you're losing volume with each breath through that through that that pneumo. Uh, it may be something else, uh, you know, any type of surgery, any tracheal surgery, uh, where you're you're graphing, or if you have like a tra I saw a, a, a surgery one time where a patient had his tra had a trachea that was stenotic, so they went in and they they sl they pr basically sliced it right down the middle and they opened it back up to a normal size. Then they took a piece of cartilage and created what they call a, a boat flap over the top of it. And this cartilage was sutured in to the trachea to put a, basically put a bandaid or a patch that was going to become permanent over the incision where they increased it, right? Well, we come back, we're on pressure control and we've got these really small tidal volumes coming back. And it's like, oh, that's just pressure control. Remember, volumes will vary in pressure control. And I was like, yeah, but that's not the case here, right? We're maxing out on, we, we're requiring 100% FiO2 to get a SAT of 89. This is all new stuff. And look, our waveform is not coming back to baseline. This tells us we have a leak somewhere. Sure enough, they went back to surgery and this graft, the sutures were failing and we were getting a leak out of that area. 
So sometimes you have to step outside the box and think about what your patient is, is, is here for and what they have going on. So you can think, oh, this is something different here. But the identification starts by recognizing the leak and then ruling out what it's not. So remember, if the volume doesn't come to baseline, it might be a leak. Now this next one here is air trap, and we're gonna stay on the flow and stay on the volume waveforms. Remember, flow waveform is supposed to do something like this and return to baseline. If it ever comes up and does not return to baseline, this equals air trapping. AT, air trapping. Your patient right here is not fully exhaling before the next breath begins. And what this is going to lead to is an increase in auto peep. So you're going to see when you do your end expiratory hold, you're going to see that your auto peep registers higher than what your set peep is. And that's because the patient is air trapping. Now, when you look at the volume, this is supposed to come up and back to baseline also. Because the patient doesn't fully exhale because they're air trapping, you may not also come back to baseline on your volume waveform. So how do I know if this is a leak or if this is air trapping, Joe? Well, it's easy. Anytime you see your volume not coming back to baseline, you look at your flow. If your flow is not coming back, then it is 100% air trapping. And we need to fix that. If your volume is not coming back to baseline, but you look up, you look up and you see where your flow is, then now you know you have a leak. Now the question is, when I see air trapping, how do I fix it? Okay, well, the key is, is uh, first of all, we need to give this person longer time for exhalation. So, one, we can increase the flow. We know that if we increase flow, we decrease eye time, therefore increasing E time. If we can give this patient a little longer to exhale before the next breath, then maybe we can solve this problem that we have here of air trapping. Now, the second way we can do this is we can decrease our tidal volume. Decreasing tidal volume also decreases eye time. It doesn't take as long to put in a smaller amount of volume. So we can decrease tidal volume, that decreases eye time, that increases E time, gives more time for exhalation. We can also decrease our respiratory rate or our frequency. If the patient is not breathing above, this usually only works if the patient is not breathing above. Because if they're triggering above the vent, then they're, they're probably just going to trigger even more. But if you decrease the respiratory rate, then what you do is you don't change eye time, but you do increase total cycle time. And when you increase total cycle time, eye time stays the same, E time gets longer. So we recognize that that is a potential opportunity also to give this patient a longer time to exhale. Now, flow is typically the preferred first choice option because both of these two will change your minute ventilation. So you can fix the air trapping, but now you may have a ventilation problem because you had a decreased tidal volume or decreased rate, and now your patient may be acidotic. And we don't want to create one problem by fixing another. So, so these two right here, keep in mind, will alter your minute ventilation, which will alter your blood gases. There's a fourth option, and that is that we can increase PEEP. We understand that PEEP also comes with potential problems. So again, if we're going to use PEEP to fix this problem, we want to make sure we're not creating another problem, maybe in, in the risk of barotrauma or uh, decreased venous return. Uh, negatively affecting our cardiac system, right? So you want to increase PEEP. Now, increasing PEEP generally is going to do this. It doesn't change eye time. It doesn't do any of that. We know that specifically in our COPDers and our asthmatics, when they are having a tough time breathing, we can teach them to purse lip breathe. We teach them to inhale through your nose and out through your lips, purse together. And what this does is creates a back pressure back at the distal airways and alveoli, stents them open so that they don't collapse prematurely because that's what happens with especially emphysema is their airways prematurely collapse because they've lost the rigidity. So as those early, those distal airways collapse prematurely, 
all the air behind them gets trapped in. Personal breathing creates a back pressure that stents them open. That's exactly what you're doing with PEEP. Except you're just not having them do it by personal breathing. You're applying the positive end expiratory pressure, the AKA back pressure from personal breathing. You're applying that for them with the intentions of stinting open those distal airways and allowing for a better, more fully complete expiratory phase to hopefully lead to more alveolar emptying um, so that we can reduce the air trapping. Now, the fifth way we can do this is, I'm just gonna put BD up here that stands for bronchodilator. If you have a person who is air trapping due to an acute bronchospasm episode, then we can provide a bronchodilator to help bronchodilate to open that airway up so that we can hopefully resolve the uh, the air trapping and allow for better movement of gas out of the airways and out of the alveoli and reduce the air trapping. So you just have to ask yourself, what's the problem? Why is the patient air trapping? We know it's because they don't have enough time to exhale, but is there something we can do anatomically to, to help them stint open the airways Open the airways larger with a bronchodilator if, there, if there's an acute bronchospasmic or, or bronchoconstriction episode present? Or do we need to do something that's going to change the expiratory time to allow for more complete emptying? That's how we treat air trapping. This next one here is called double triggering. Uh, some people refer to it as breath stacking. You know, the funny thing is that I personally never... Uh, really saw a whole bunch of double triggering early in my career as a respiratory therapist. That was back when we were using 8 to 12 mLs per kilogram to set for our tidal volume. So you can see here where nobody was, nobody was really volume hungry because we were given such large tidal volume. So they weren't saying, give me another breath. Now we've gone down, thanks to the ARDSNET protocol, we have recognized that those large tidal volumes are dangerous. So we've come and now we're utilizing more of a low tidal volume ventilation plan, right? So now we're more in this 6 mL kilogram range. Now that we're doing that, I personally have experienced an increase in patients who appear to be volume hunger evident by the increased episodes of double triggering. What does this look like? Well, basically what it is is, is you got your pressure waveform coming here, breath goes up, and then the breath quits. And then immediately another breath is triggered and you see your pressure waveform increase. And we'll explain why here in just a second. On your flow, say we got a decelerating waveform here, comes down here, and then immediately another breath happens. Now the funny thing is, is the flow waveform starts over, right? Because the flow waveform is always going to start from zero. So it says, okay, I'm exhaling. But, oh, you took another breath, then boom, let's give you another breath. Same thing happens in volume. You're coming along here, volume comes up, and then back down, and then the patient, and then the patient immediately takes another tidal volume. And then you see your tidal volume come down like this, way down here below. How many of you have ever seen that? You're looking at your volume waveform, and you say, why is it going way down there off the bottom of the screen? It doesn't make any sense. Here's what happens. The first breath is given. It goes in and then the ventilator cycles into exhalation. When the ventilator cycles into exhalation, the patient's diaphragm is still dropping because they want more volume. Okay, this is an active breathing uh, asynchrony here. Okay, this is not something that if the patient's not triggering any breaths, you're not gonna get this. This happens when you have a patient actively breathing during the, 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 the vent breath. So the vent cuts off and the patient's diaphragm is still dropping and it immediately triggers another breath. See, the vent doesn't know I, you got to give time to exhalation. It doesn't recognize that. It just says, oh, you want a breath? Here's a breath. And it gives another breath. And that's exactly what happens. Now, the reason you see your pressure waveform go way up here high is because what we've essentially done is let's just say this side of volume right here was 400. And let's just say this one is also 400 because we're in ACVC. So you put in the first 400 and then you immediately put in another 400. So what you've really done essentially is given one big breath at 800. 
Both of these together basically went in without one of them coming out first. So you essentially have given a tidal volume of 800 mLs. And that's exactly why you see this big increase in your pressure because you put this second breath in on top of this first breath without an expiratory phase in between. Now, that also explains why we come way down here below baseline. This four, first 400 came in and not very much of it came out. So when the next breath comes in, the patient still has to exhale essentially two breaths. The 400 that went in comes out and then the first 400 has got to come out. And that's why it goes way down here below baseline. So you see where you get breath in, very small exhale tidal volume. And then when this next breath comes in and exhales, you get an exhale vo tidal volume of 772. And you're like, wait a second, I'm on 400. Why am I getting 772? Your patient took an additional breath on top of a breath and they both came out together. Now, the question is, why does this happen? And the answer is because the patient is not satisfied with that tidal volume of 400. You see, patients are, dry, are breathing off of a neural drive to breathe and they want to feel satisfied. And so at the end of that breath, the patient is still saying, I'm still taking some more. Now we're giving, let's just say 400. What we don't know is if the patient wants 415, 450, 500. We don't know how much they want. All we know is because we're in volume control, all we know is that when they take that second breath, they're going to get 400 twice. So they're basically going to get 800. So I've had these discussions with, with different healthcare personnel and I'm like, what do you do in this situation? And they say, well, this person needs more sedation. They shouldn't be triggering breaths like that. Well, we know that more sedation comes with longer vent days. So what if there is a solution to this that doesn't require increased sedation? What if there's a solution to this that's like perhaps maybe finding out what the patient wants to stop the, the double triggering, to satisfy them in a single breath? What if we only have to increase this tidal volume to 415 to get them to stop? Well, when you start saying things like that, now you're going above six mLs per kilogram, right? Like, no, we're staying six mLs per kilogram and we're riding that to the end. We're not moving off of it. Well, remember this all started with the ArsNet protocol when they said we need to go low tidal volume, higher rates, lower tidal volumes, right? Look what else the ArsNet protocol says. Probably a little small for y'all to read. Try to make it as big as I can here. You can find this slide right here by simply going to Google Googling ArgeNet protocol and it'll bring you straight to this slide right here. Now, I know the light in here messes up for just a second, but if you'll just follow me here, uh, this is straight from the ArgeNet protocol itself. And it says if right here, if plateau pressure and breath stacking or dyssynchrony occurs, you may increase the tidal volume one ml per kilogram increments to seven or eight mLs per kilogram, so long the plateau pressure stays less than 30 centimeters of water pressure. So what does that mean for us? Well, what it means is, is if 400 is six mLs per kilogram, we can go up to seven. Maybe six and a half is what this patient is looking for. What the ArsNet protocol tells us is we can go up to eight as long as our plateau pressure stays less than 30. And perhaps that will solve this flow hunger dyssynchrony that we are seeing when this happens. So keep that in mind. You can use that as a reference, as a resource. Um, it's always valuable to be able to, to make recommendations, but then also to be able to back them up with where the data comes from. Okay, uh, this is going to be the flow volume loop. So this is going to be normal. So what we look for here on the flow volume loop is for normal, we look for it to come around like this and then expiratory happens and we come back to baseline like this. Now, all this is saying is, is that we're going to put flow 
over volume. That's all we're doing here. So we're taking our two scalar graphics and now putting them together in an X, Y axis and plotting them out. And this is what we get. This should close over here because remember, this is zero. And we already talked about the flow and the volume waveforms. Remember, they should come back to zero. And if they don't, then it could be air trapping or a leak. Well, you're going to have already seen that on your waveforms. But if you ever see where... If you ever see where you have a flow volume loop that does like this and it doesn't close, well, guess what? That might very well be air trapping or a leak. Now, you can't tell which one it is from the flow volume loop because it's in representation of both. What you are looking for is having to go back to the waveforms and go, why isn't this closing? And I promise you, one or both of those flow or or volume waveforms will not be returning the baseline. That's, that's your answer. It's one of those. It's either air trapping or a leak. Okay, the other thing you might see on this waveform is something that looks like this. Now, we call this a sawtooth pattern. Sawtooth patterns are associated either with secretions in the airways, so you'll hear a lot of coarse crackles when you listen, May, need, may mean that the patient needs to be suctioned. May also be associated with turbulent flow due to bronchospasm. So you may hear expiratory wheezing and it may give you this, this sawtooth pattern. It may also just be a building up of condensation in your ventilator circuitry. So when you look at that, you, um, you, you look at this, you check your circuit. You got a lot, of, a lot of condensation in your circuit. You drain it out. This smoothens out and goes away. If it's secretions, you suction the patient, they become clear. These, these sawtooth patterns should go away. If it's bronchospasm, you give a bronchodilator. Depending on if it fully goes away or if it just improves, they may get lessened or they may, they may reduce or they may go away. So that's what you're looking for, though. When you see the sawtooth pattern, you're asking yourself, do I have secretions in my airways? Do I have condensation in my circuit? Or do I have a presence of bronchospasm here? Now, there's one other thing you can see on this loop, and that is when it does something like this. This is what we refer to as a concave expiratory limb or an expiratory side of the loop. Um, anytime you see this concave appearance, or I like to refer to it as a scoop in the loop, you can kind of see this has this little scooped out appearance. Anytime you see that, this equals and obstruction. Now, what could cause an obstruction? Well, that's the question. That's the critical thinking part that you as an RT know that some other people may not be aware of. An obstruction can be caused by multiple things. So this could be the result of lots of different things. Perhaps it's just an emphysema patient or an obstructive lung disease patient, and that's their disease process. It's going to show an obstructive flow volume loop. Perhaps it's related to secretion. So maybe you see this and you have a little sawtooth pattern because we know secretions can increase our airway resistance, increase our expiratory flow obstruction and cause a scooped out appearance. It could be bronchospasm. It could be a patient biting it in the tracheal tube. You have to figure out which one of those it is and then treat it accordingly. This scoop does not always mean give a bronchodilator. It does if it's bronchospasm, but if it's secretions, then this scoop is going to be looked to be resolved by suctioning of the patient. If it is biting of the endotracheal tube, then this is going to be resolved and fixed by placing a bite block. If it is a disease process, this is probably just a scoop you're going to you're going to live with. You're going to know that again if they've got air trapping present from this. Maybe we can add some peep. But for the most part, this obstruction, if it's due to the end-stage emphysema, is part of their disease process, and you know that. So this is what the flow volume looks like. You want to be able to recognize an obstruction, recognize secretions, and if it's not closing. Now, my very favorite loop is the pressure volume loop. Normal looks like this. And when we see a normal pressure volume loop, there's some key areas that we need to recognize. We need to recognize that the loop starts right here. This is wherever we have PEEP set. So wherever PEEP is set, that's what we, we have. This is the beginning of the breath. 
okay? Wherever this turns and starts to go up, this is what we call our lower inflection point. Now, this lower inflection point is very, very important. We'll talk about it here in just a little bit. This last point up here is where inspiration ends and we start to turn back for exhalation. This is going to be a point of emphasis as well. Okay. Now, we also know that the angle at which this loop is being drawn tells us something. OK, so it should be on this 45 level scoop. And then also the width of this is also very important as it relates to airway resistance. Now, let's look at some abnormalities on this. The first one is over distension. So when we look at our pressure volume loop, we see it coming up like this and we see something like this on the end. This right here is what we call a bird beak appearance. And this is the evidence of over distension. This can be related to either an excessively large tidal volume or an excessively too high of a peak that is set that a tidal volume is being applied on top of. Either way, what's happening here is we're getting an, a whole lot of pressure change now because pressure is on the bottom without a lot of volume change. So anytime the pressure volume loop goes flat like that, it means more pressure to achieve less volume. And that's what's happening here. You're, you, you've gotten, the lungs have gotten to a point to where now they're going, I can't take any more volume. You're just gonna be pushing me open more and more and more and over distending me. This is gonna put you at an increased risk for barotrauma or ventilator induced lung injury. We wanna recognize this. We want to identify if it's the tidal volume that is inappropriate or is it the peep that is inappropriate. You have to figure out which one of those it is. The next thing we might see on a pressure volume loop is a patient that might present with a failure to trigger. Now, remember we talked about this earlier looking at your pressure waveform. Anytime you see that little dip and you don't get a breath, well, that means that the patient tried to take a breath but couldn't get one. So now we look at this. And what we see here is you'll see a negative like this on the back side. Now, remember, this is supposed to go on and draw a flow volume loop. OK, anytime you see that right there, but you don't get a loop behind it, then what that is is a negative pull that didn't result in a breath happening. Now, this may also be present with a loop on it and that might be that hey it didn't it's not that it failed to trigger it's just that it was extremely difficult for the patient to trigger the breath and so maybe this right here we call this a fishtail appearance maybe the patient is flow hunger extremely distressed and just sucking in really really hard because of that increased neural drive to breathe or maybe our sensitivity is set incorrectly so we need to recognize that essentially this is just an increased effort at the beginning of the breath, not at the end. Now remember I told you that these, this loop is supposed to be on a 45 degree angle. It's kind of sitting like that. If it ever goes and starts laying down, that is a reduction in static compliance. What I mean by that is if it ever looks like this. You can see here where this loop here is clearly further down than this first one that is drawn representing normal. Now, what this could be, things like pneumonia, ARDS, pneumothorax, pleural effusion, uh, you know, anything that causes a reduction in your, your static compliance is, could cause your, your waveform here to, low, to, to lay down. Okay, basically reduce. So just remember, less than 45 laying down is a reduction in compliance. Now, the opposite is true also. If it goes up more this way, that is an increase in compliance. So down is a decrease in compliance. Up is an increase in compliance. This may be more representative of your emphysematic patients. We know that they have, an old, they have overly compliant lungs. And so you can see it standing more straight up in this fashion like that compared to normal. And that would be something, like I said, comparative to emphysema. Now, now understand that compliance is, is, a, is on a pendulum. It's not just up or down. So if you start here and you move to here, 
then you see your loop is increasing, it's standing up. This is an indication of an increasing compliance. Your patient's lungs, your, your, your patient's pulmonary status in terms of compliance is improving because you're getting that rise. And so you recognize that it doesn't have to be down or up emphysema or pneumonia. It's an improving or a decreasing compliance scale. Now we can also see airway resistance. Airway resistance shows up. Remember I drew this earlier and I showed you this is normal. We're talking about the width here. This is associated with airway resistance. So this would represent normal. If you ever saw something that looked like this. And you see that big increase in this protrusion on the inspiratory side of things. That is increased airway resistance. So this right here, you, at, at seven o'clock, you see it like this. At seven o'clock, you assess this. At 10 o'clock, you come in to find this. That is an increase in your airway resistance. Is it secretions? Is it some other type of obstruction? Is it acute bronchospasm? Find the problem, know the solution. Okay, we're going to go back to the waveforms here. I saved this one kind of for last because it's one of my um, most passionate that I like to, to really talk about, and that is the recognition of flow hunger. It is um, a personal interest of mine to identify flow hunger early in all of my patients because what I believe is, is that when you take a patient and you put them on mechanical ventilation, when you tell a patient, hey, we're going to put this tube in your airway, we're going to help you breathe until your lungs are healthier, then I take an extreme amount of, of pride in being able to do that to the patient's liking, not to the, hey, we're going to put you on the vent, but we're going to do it our way, even if you don't like it. And this is one of the greatest dyssynchronies that I find is flow hunger. And that's typically because, at least in this area, we use a lot of volume control and we have a set flow. Well, if that set flow does not match your patient's inspiratory desire. So again, we're talking about an actively breathing patient. If the patient is wanting more than what the ventilator is delivering, then that patient is going to feel distressed and getting a breath that does not match the way they want it to look. So for example, it will look something like this. Remember your flow is set so it's not going any higher so let's just say that we have a flow of 40 liters per minute let's say we have a we get this pressure wave from that looks like this that's what it looks like so you see this little concave scoop in the pressure waveform up on the top kind of kind of looks like a camel hump in the middle of the breath remember it's not supposed to look like this this is supposed to come up and just kind of round out like that. But we've got this big loop, big drop right here. Well, what's happening right there? Well, what's happening is, is that your patient's lungs, their diaphragm, the breath started, but then the diaphragms are dropping faster than what that breath is coming in. And what that is doing is as your, as your, as your flow here is decelerating, your diaphragm is pulling that flow, that pressure out of the circuit. With that, with that change in those thoracic pressures, it shows up on the pressure waveform. Now, I know this is, this is kind of sometimes a challenging thought process to grasp because we typically think, okay, well, flow, why does it show up on the flow pattern? Because when we're in volume control, this is a set pattern. The patient cannot alter this. And so you will not see changes because the vent is in control of the flow pattern. So what we see here is that we need to give this breath faster to keep up with the patient's diaphragm. Now, people start getting nervous when you start increasing flow. But what happens is you take this flow and you increase it to 60 liters per minute. And what will happen is you may see something like this. And that's exactly right. Now, we still see a scoop here, right? But what you will see is that we have clearly gotten better 
here than what we were here. You can see that this flows of 60 is closer to what they are looking for as opposed to this flow of 40. So you say, okay, well, maybe a flow of, of 70 gets us there, right? And what we see with the flow of 70 is maybe we get there, maybe we don't. Okay, so you have to ask that, um, you know, how do you just recognizing that dip in the pressure waveform is the key. That's the key. Now, there is one other little caveat to this. I want to show you one other thing that you can sometimes consider um, in the presence of flow hunger. And that is if you ever see something that looks like this. So let's say we go with this and it goes like this. Okay, to where now you see more of the dip on the back side, and maybe this dips and comes back up. I don't know, maybe it doesn't drop all the way down. These, these, these show up all kinds of different ways. But you see now where you get a dip, it's almost like the initial pressure was good, right? But look what's happening. We're getting this dip down in the middle of the decelerating flow pattern. So perhaps, just perhaps in this case, if we were to go to a square flow pattern and hold that flow at that set setting constant throughout, maybe it'll stay exceeded above the patient's dropping diaphragm and you may be able to work something out that looks more like that. That is a solution that has been resolved. Now, if you ever see this, you ever see these, these, these asynchronies where your patient's you know, diaphragm is dropping, they appear to be flow hunger, I would challenge you to assess your occlusion pressure. Your occlusion pressure is probably going to be elevated because the reason this person is flow hungry is because they're neurally distressed. The ventilator is not delivering the breath in the fashion that they like it. And the longer you keep somebody who's trying to catch their breath from being able to catch their breath, the more distressed they get. So I have literally... Uh, seen before patterns that look something like this. I have, I have li promise you, I've literally seen patients that are so flow hungry that they are sucking the pressure all the way down below zero in the middle of a breath because they're that distressed. Either, either this flow is not correct Either this vent mode is not correct or, or something, obviously something is not correct. And obviously this right here is not going to lead to good outcomes when it comes to getting that patient off the ventilator quicker with, with, with successful extubations and out of the ICU quicker and out of the hospital quicker. So something's got to be done about that. Just start recognizing it, noticing it and asking yourself, what can I do to fix this? Flow is a lot of times going to be and at least the solution that might be a uh, part of the problem to get you there. Or let's get into another mode of mechanical ventilation. So that's flow hunger. Now we can still talk about flow hunger here when we talk about the pressure volume loop. If you ever see a pressure volume loop that looks like this, kind of makes an S shape appearance. And you're like, wait a second, that doesn't even look anything close to normal, right? Like this thing's supposed to come out here and come up. And then come back, well, here's what's happening. Remember, when we drew the pressure waveform, you were getting that dip right there. Well, that dip right there from the diaphragm pulling pressure out of the circuit is the same mechanism that is pulling this front side of this loop, now sucking it in to where you're getting this S-shaped appearance. So this is all going to go together. If you see that on your pressure waveform, you're going to see something like this on your pressure volume loop because that dip is going to coordinate with that dip there or that sucking in right there. So this is what this is. You see this a lot. It's flow hunger. We got to find a ways to fix it, get better at recognizing it and doing something about it. Okay. So we're going to wrap this up here, but before I do so, I just want to put this all together so you can kind of see how they all play a role with each other. And we're just going to use the example of air trapping as the example here, okay? So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to start with the flow pattern. 
this is our pressure waveform. This is our volume waveform. Uh, this is obviously our pressure volume loop, and this is our flow volume loop. Okay, so I'm just going to start with the flow waveform. I'm just going to draw. It's going to come up here, come here. We're going to come down, and guess what we're not going to do? We're not going to come back to baseline. So that tells us right there that we know we have air trapping. Now, I look at the volume waveform. Volume waveform comes up. It also doesn't come back to baseline. Why not? Because we're air trapping. If all the air and all the flow doesn't stop, ever reach zero, then there's still going to be volume that's coming back. But because both of these and because the flow is not, then we know this points to air trapping. Now, why are we air trapping? Well, we know a big cause of air trapping might be something like bronchospasm or anything that is going to cause an increase in our airway resistance. So when we look up here at our pressure waveform, we might see something that looks like this. So this would support a bronchospasm. This increased difference right there from pip to peak says, hey, you got an increase in your airway resistance. Now we know that an increase in airway resistance due to a bronchospasm is going to cause some type of obstruction. That's why we're air trapping. So when we look here on our flow volume loop, we may see something that looks like this. And perhaps it doesn't close. Why? Because of the air trapping. This tells us bronchospasm. The scoop tells us an obstruction is present. And then when we look at our pressure volume loop, we see something that looks like this. That big increase right there is going to be your increase in your raw. You're increasing your airway resistance with that big protrusion right there on the belly. Okay, so this says everything about airway resistance. And that's how all this ties together. When you think about all of these things, you're going, okay, air trapping, air trapping, airway resistance, that goes with obstruction, that goes with air trapping, it's supported by my flow volume loop, and it's supported by my increase in uh, my airway resistance from my pressure volume loop. I do want to go back and show you one thing here real quick um, before we talk about the references. If I can go back to uh, this one right here, I told you I was going to show you how to identify PEEP uh, using your pressure volume loop or a better PEEP using your pressure volume loop. Uh, basically, remember when we look at this, it goes like this, and you're looking at this point at which it changes directions, which is about right there. This is what we call our lower inflection point. This is lower inflection point. Now, what this means is, is that the lungs didn't want to open. But right about here, they said, oh, we'll open now. And they became very, very compliant. So what we can do is we can recognize this lower inflection point, also known, aka, is our critical opening pressure. Critical opening pressure. So what we do is we come down here, we go, okay, well, this is falling at around nine centimeters of water pressure. Okay. Well, by the looks of this, if we were to set our peep at nine, then we would start at a state to where the alveoli are open and ready to receive volume. And so this is what you're looking for, this lower inflection point. And sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. If you have one, you know, you think about, I like to think about it more like a diamond. Typically, if it looks like this, then it's much easier, right? You can recognize here's our lower inflection point. This is optimal peak. And then on the back side, what we see is we have a spot here where we start to lose volume here too. This is the cr critical closing pressure. This is where we should recognize that we should have minimal peak set. So really we should be coming back here and then going straight down. Because what that means is we don't allow all of this de-recruitment to happen in this phase as these alveoli close shut past the critical closing point. Essentially, what this says is, is if you look at your critical closing point, you come down here and let's say it is six. You find your optimal peak level. You come down here, let's say it's 11. This right here becomes your window of identifying where that best peak should be for that patient. Ideally, you would want it greater than six. 
optimally around 11. But depending on how that affects your cardiac st status um, and your oxygenation and everything else, plateau pressure, this may not be optimal peak, but it is a reference point to get you there, okay? So I um, wanted to clarify that real quick before we wrap this up. And then to wrap this up, you know, don't forget I referenced the ArsNet protocol back there um, earlier in this. You can always go back and utilize that uh, when, you're, when you're looking for, for just, you, there's so many things in that protocol that are valuable. Um, when do we adjust rate? When do we adjust tidal volume? Little thing, keywords, you can increase, you know, tidal volume up to seven to eight mLs per kilogram as long as plateau stays less than 30 when breath stacking is present. That's a key element that will help you utilize that protocol more efficiently and better. Um, so also in terms of that, I also used a reference by EMRATH, um, basics of ventilator waveforms. This did come out of the pediatric reports. Wildly enough, these are all very, very, very similar when it comes to waveforms. And then obviously out of Egan's uh, Fundamentals of Respiratory Care, obviously lots of information on waveforms in there supports a lot of the stuff that we talked about here. If you are interested in reaching me, um, you can do so at any of the social media sites, Respiratory Coach on Instagram, Respiratory Coach on YouTube, Coach RRT on Twitter, RespiratoryCoach at gmail.com. What I would love for you to do is text me at 1-817-968-7035. This is my new texting platform where I am... I'll bring that back down so you can see that. Um, where I am engaging with the community on just a different level, just weekly inspiration, motivation, education, happy birthday, just different stuff like that. 817-968-7035. If you're watching this playback, I just want to say thank you. I appreciate you coming. I appreciate you being here. I hope you learned something. I hope you take some of this information, head out, go be warriors at the bedside, impact your patients by getting them off the ventilators quicker through the mechanism of providing better mechanical ventilation while they're on it. All of that should help to serve the patient. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Respiratory Associates, for having me, and y'all have a good day.